Welcome to the first session of Friday. My name is Laura Lewis, and I'm the director for the Washington State University Food Systems Program. And I'm so honored to be here to facilitate this session with four incredible speakers. Um, you're in the session for accessing agrobiodiversity, practical knowledge for finding and using rare seeds. So if this is not the session you are planning to attend, you can uh, quietly exit now. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Despite staggering losses in crop, bio, in crop diversity over the past century, from commercial varieties falling out of favor to crop wild relatives lost to habitat destruction, the world is still home to a great diversity of plants relevant to agriculture, collectively known as agrobiodiversity. Between traditional farming communities, public and private seed banks, garden scale seed savers, and wild and feral plant populations, a wide array of crop plants are still available to people who work with seed. Learn practical tools and strategies from farmer breeders, public breeders, and regional seed companies on how to find and access novel and diverse germplasm through formal and informal networks and collections. These presentations will include issues related to seed importation and recognition of sources of origin, including respect for farmers and breeders' rights in using these plant genetic resources. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with Nate, Cli with Nate Kleiman, and then we're gonna hear from Sarah Klieger, um, Esther casas Guerrera, and then we're gonna end with Phil Simon. Um, this session is being recorded, so when we have questions, I have a mic that I can bring out, or you can use the mics on each side of the room so we can really capture uh, what you're saying. Um, and do we have any questions before we get started? Great. Okay, well, I'm going to invite Nate up here. Um, let me see here. Nate is a farmer, plant breeder, activist, and co-founder of the nonprofit Exper Experimental Farm Network. He was born in Philadelphia and lives in farms today in Elmer, New Jersey, and Norwich, New York. A graduate of Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, he worked in a range of fields from theater to politics to union organizing to disaster relief before settling into farming, though he still occasionally works for politicians or runs for Congress. EFN uses an open source online platform to facilitate collaborative research in sustainable agriculture, plant breeding, and climate change mitigation, especially through the development of perennial staple crops and functions as a small-scale cooperative seed company, offering rare heirlooms, land races, breeding populations, and perennial vegetables unavailable from other commercial sources. Nate is passionate about many crops, but at the moment is most focused on sorghum, Job's Tears, Mayapple, Monkey Puzzle, and Chinkapin Chestnut. Let's welcome Nate. Thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate that introduction, which I wrote. Um, <laughs> Um, so uh, we're going to talk about a, f a few different topics. I'm not sure we're going to actually hit everything in the, uh, in the description, but we'll try our best. Um, and my, uh, the focus of my portion of the talk is utilizing government gene banks. Um, there are a whole lot of questions about this all the time. People are always asking me about how I get stuff out of the government gene banks. And um, I'm here to illuminate that. Uh, so I thought I'd throw in some pretty pictures to hold your interest of some of the some of my favorite things that I've gotten out of uh, the government gene banks through the years, and then I'll get into the uh, um, nitty gritty of how to do it. Uh, so this is a melon uh, from the Maldives in the Indian Ocean. Uh, this is what the screen looks like on the government website, and we'll we'll talk through all of these portions um, in a bit. But you can see. Um, this one says it's wild material um, right here. It was originally collected as a seed in 1986 on a, a farm store on an island called Hitadu in the Lamu Atoll in the Maldives. Um, interestingly, you can see it was re-identified on April 22nd, 1999. Uh, people used to think that it was a cucumber, and then they realized it's a melon. 
Uh, when it's young, it looks like a cucumber and you can use it as a cucumber, but that flesh is actually sour when it ripens. Clearly it was bred for the uh, gel around the seeds rather than for the um, traditional flesh of a melon that we usually eat. Uh, this is a pepper from Aleppo in Syria. Uh, it's from the, it was originally collected at the Bab Al Faraj seed market, which uh, was destroyed by the war. Uh, and it was collected in 1999. Um, this is a sorghum, one of my favorite plants. I'm going to talk a little bit more about. This one is coral sorghum from South Sudan. The town is uh, Malakal. And uh, this is what it looks like. I originally got this one because I did a search for the name Malakal, which is a town in South Sudan where my friend Simon is from. I wanted to, he's lived in, in the US for decades and I wanted to see if I could grow anything from his town. And sure enough, there were nine varieties of sorghum in the government database. He's laughing because I grew, I did a terrible job that year. We had army worm infestation, so he's actually saying, this is the worst sorghum I've ever seen. <laughs> um, these are, these are uh, wild strawberries that were collected uh, by Kim Hummer, who runs the uh, Corvallis Germplasm Repository. Uh, these were collected at a rest stop in Maine, and I first requested them because this description had a very tantalizing uh, story down here from a study in 2007. It says, Fruit were significantly superior in anti-cancer properties when tested for inhibition of proliferation of A549 human lung epithelial cancer cells. A cancer-fighting wild strawberry thought would be pretty cool. Um, and they're really delicious. So they have perennials in there as well. Um, we've got some wild asparagus seeds. Uh, this is a perennial called uh, Cramby tataria, tartar bread plant relative of sea kale, but uh, developed for the thick root, uh, which can be ground up, added to bread. I got some Job's Tears uh, from them. The, only one of these is from the government. I got a bunch of other ones. They have, that's a perennial grain from the tropics, and these are thin-shelled varieties. They have woody plants like currants, um, things like garlic, uh, even totally obscure plants that you wouldn't expect to be able to find, like jojoba, which uh, they sent me these cuttings. Um, so the national plant germplasm system has got locations all over the country. Uh, there used to be more, but budget cuts have led to some really amazing collections being shut down through the years. Uh, so there is definitely in this talk a, a political call to action if there's, when, there's an, uh, when there's a budget fight, which there always is. It, people need to stand up for this stuff because it's one of the greatest things that the government does by a mile. Um, you can see all over uh, Geneva up in New York, that's where the, a lot of the apples, grapes, cherries can be found. Uh, Pullman, Washington has a lot of the, um, a lot of the legumes, pulses, uh, your fava beans, chickpeas. Corvallis here, there's uh, the Rubus raspberry blackberry collection, uh, strawberries, blueberries, some, some remaining chestnuts. Most of them were lost from when the uh, Byron um, station closed in Georgia. Um, there are, in Ames, there's a whole bunch of grains. Um, and yeah, everyone has, a, has different specialties. Uh, when they send you the seeds, they look like this often. Um, you can see my scrawl of more information on there. That one was a, a fava bean from the Damascus Bazaar in Syria. Uh, this is a, a sunflower from Iran. Ames has uh, some of the best information on the, uh, on the packets. They tell you all sorts of things like the percent of uh, viable seeds the last time it was grown out, um, percent of seeds that are normal, really useful information. Uh, here's an a oil seed from India. It's an unknown species of brassica, which is why that annotation is there. So, where to start? Um, this is what the website looks like, the Germplasm Resources Information Network. And anybody who has a quote-unquote legitimate research, breeding, or educational purpose has a right to access this material. 
Um, you can, all you have to do when you, uh, when you ultimately make a request is write a paragraph of what you're going to use the material for. Um, and it doesn't have to be too complicated. Sometimes you might get some pushback from, from somebody, but if you explain what you're doing it for, they have form letters they'll send if they think somebody's you know, requesting seeds for home use and not planning to do anything scientific with it or educational. Um, so if you just write back, they're, they're usually pretty good about sending it on. I mean, these are the people who maintain this system are professionals who are doing this because they love it, they think it's important, and they want this material to get out there. We have hundreds of thousands of things in, our, in the government collection that have been collected over a century from around the world, and they're not doing any good if they're sitting in a freezer. Um, this stuff has got to be out there and, and used, and uh, you can bet that the corporations are, are getting stuff out of it. They're using it for patented material. They're genetically modifying stuff that they originally got in here. Um, but we all have the ability to access it. And I started getting seeds from them before, uh, before I had a nonprofit, before I was a farmer, um, when I was growing stuff in my backyard and just starting to really get interested in this. Um, but yeah, you, you may get some pushback. Um, so uh, when I do talk on, about this, um, I usually start by um, typing in the town where I'm doing the presentation and seeing what comes up. Uh, Corvallis predictably has quite a few things, although there's much more in the US government collection that doesn't show up here because the word Corvallis isn't necessarily in the entry. So there are 91 things here in the system uh, that, that have the word Corvallis in the description. Um, the first one I clicked on uh, is this uh, Ananasnaya. Now, if you don't know Latin names of things very well, you might say, okay, what the heck is Actinidia arguta? Um, but you can click on that, and it will tell you, you'll get this page with information about that species. It tells you common names in multiple languages often. It tells you other, um, other uh, subspecies or variations in that, uh, within that species tells you how many are available in the system. You can also click on that and get a list of all of them in that species. And then it tells you the economic importance, what, uh, what that species is used for. Sometimes it has all the information in there. Sometimes there's stuff that's missing. But in this case, uh, this is hardy kiwi. It's used as an ornamental. It's used as a human food for the fruit and materials, there's potential as a source of chemicals like chlorophyll and polysaccharides, which are potential use for human health. Um, so then it also tells you where it's found, where it's uh, native to, where it's cultivated, and where it's naturalized. Uh, in this case, you can see there's some wild hardy kiwis in Maine and Massachusetts, which I did not know. Um, so, I think I clicked on a couple of other things in, uh, so here's, here's the picture of this, um, of this one. This is actually a very common and popular uh, hardy kiwi variety. Um, and if you request it, you see they will send you five cuttings. And it, they specify here, you will receive unrooted cuttings, not rooted plants, unless specific arrangements have been made with the curator. So you usually get five pieces of wood in a Ziploc bag that's a little damp, and, um, and then you have to root it yourself or graft it. Um, this one has a little bit more information here. So next I'm going to talk about this part, which is really critical for navigating through the system, the observations. If you're interested in breeding or doing, uh, or doing some, and any kind of work with these plants, um, you're going to want to figure out what is in those observations here. So you can scroll and see everything they have that this individual variety has been um, tested for. Sometimes they have never tested it. But this one, in this case, it's been, it's been included in a couple, it looks like a couple of different tests, one in 2009, one in 2010. They, they have various studies that, uh, that happen and all the information gets put in here. So this one has a ton of information. A lot of, them, a lot of species, uh, don't, when they study them, they don't get this much. So there's everything from the color of the flesh inner pericarp to the flesh texture. Um, and then 
I was interested in, uh, where is it? I was interested in the flower scent because I'd never seen that one uh, listed. And some of these are very subjective. They're not always numbers. They're uh, things like rose. Apparently this one smells like rose. So if you're interested in, oh, what other scents can you find in this species, you can click flower scent. And then you'll get a page that looks like this. And they've only tested uh, 11 of these. Um, or actually, it looks like nine, but a couple of them must smell like different things, two different things. Um, so there were three that they tested that, that someone thought smelled like honeysuckle, two like lemon, three like, uh, six like rose. So I clicked on the honeysuckle to see what those were. And then if I want to request one of those, I can just click on this accession, add it to my shopping cart, and uh, eventually they'll send it to you. Um, another one that was in Corvallis that I clicked on because it said New Jersey and I farm in New Jersey uh, was a blueberry called Pink Lemonade that you might see at the nurseries uh, these days. It's got loads of information on this page about where it came from. The original cross was made in Chatsworth, New Jersey, 1991, selected in 1996. Um, it's been evaluated at a bunch of places, including here in Corvallis and then lots of information about, uh, about how it's, how it's uh, used, how it grows, agronomic qualities. And it was named for the pink fruit color. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of information on, on this one. I didn't click on the observations, but they have a picture. You can click on the picture and uh, blow it up. So that's a really pretty blueberry. Um, some of the work that I do, I, so I started this nonprofit called the Experimental Farm Network, and we, um, we've done a lot of work trying to get plants, get varieties out of green that are from threatened communities, uh, whether they're threatened by war or sea level rise or um, out migration due to, uh, due to economics, poverty, neoliberal capitalism, all of that. Um, so we, uh, I've often gone in looking for when there's something terrible happening in the world, I've gone in and said, what, what kind of plants do we have from that place? And what can we get out um, and grow? So I typed in homes a few years ago, which is the uh, city in Syria that was has been devastated by the war. Um, and uh, one of my f absolute favorite squash came out of Grin. This is a, this is a, a zucchini, a kusa type squash from homes. Um, it's really beautiful when they get uh, when they get full size. They turn white like this. They don't become a big baseball bat, um, and you can still use it for a while when it's still white. Once it starts getting more tan like these or yellow, then it gets uh, woody, and you don't want to eat it. But they're best, of course, when they're small, like most zucchini. Really buttery, delicious thing. Um, so this is what that entry looks like. It was originally collected in 1949 in Syria by the uh, CO Iyer of the Near East Foundation and then donated uh, it to the USDA. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight on this one is the improvement status up at the top. Uh, you'll often see it will say cultivar, it might say breeding material or wild material we saw already, and this one says land race. And now just for folks who aren't familiar with that term, it's probably gonna come up again. Um, a land race is essentially a uh, variety that lacks formal crop improvement has a distinct identity and, and characteristics that are the same across, um, across the population. It's got a historical origin. It's often uh, associated with a, a traditional farming system, um, and it's typically genetically diverse and locally adapted. Um, this is another land race from Holmes. It's a watermelon. There's a lot of diversity in this population, but some of them, we've had them keep for like six months. Um, this is a uh, scalded tomato <laughs> from Holmes, uh, another really wonderful land race. And then some of the work that we do, and, and I, I figured I'd include this slide, um, is, uh, you know, we, I've tried to wrap my head around the, um, the politics of and the ethics of receiving seed that was somebody else's cultural heritage, that our government, which has done so much 
awful stuff around the world through the years, has gone out and collected, probably didn't pay any money to the people they got it from, didn't compensate them. Um, and this stuff has, you know, it's gone all over the place without the knowledge or um, consent of the people who develop these varieties. So uh, we've made an effort to get some of these traditional varieties when we're able to grow them successfully back to some of the folks who they came from originally. So um, I was contacted by a woman who's a relief worker in Lebanon, works with Syrian refugees. And um, this, is a, this is a picture of a refugee camp in, Syri in Lebanon where some Syrian refugees were able to grow some of their traditional crops. Uh, in, actually, this tomato is one that uh, the reports that we got back were that this was really a beloved uh, variety and that they didn't think they would have access to again uh, after they left homes. Um, I also gave them some of that uh, South Sudanese sorghum because I knew it would do okay in the desert and they liked that one too. Um, we typed in Kandahar, Afghanistan. Um, there's quite a, few, quite a few things there. One of the more interesting, you'll often find kind of mysteries on these, uh, um, on these pages. Like this one again, it's an unknown species of Lepidium. That's the pepper grass uh, species. Collected in 1954, it was misidentified as the last B. arvens until 2008. So it was in there for almost 60 years with the wrong identification. Uh, but it turns out to be a really cool plant. When we got it, the, the packet said that it hadn't been, um, hadn't been grown out since 1991, and we ended up with like 3 4% germination. Um, but it's, this is, the leaf is about three times longer than any pepper grass leaf that I had seen before. Seed heads are really big. I think it's probably an oil seed variety. So that was one cool thing we found. This is another eggplant from uh, Kandahar. This is a land race okra. Uh, and then the, I think the last section I have here is finding breeding stock. If you have a particular project in mind, how might you use these, uh, the, the observation section to figure out what you wanna, what you wanna grow. So uh, I typed in soybean, because I knew that there's a interesting trait that they've studied in here. I clicked on one random one, the South, Southern Manchurian yellow. Uh, this was donated in 1911 um, by the Pacific Oil Mills in Seattle. It's the only thing that they donated that's in the collection. Um, and then the, the interesting thing down here, this is what, when I first saw this note, I said, huh, what's that about? Uh, human allergen P34, which is one of the allergens that, that causes uh, people to have an allergy to soy. Um, so when I went in here, I clicked on this human allergen P34. Of the 14,000 plus for, uh, accessions that they've tested, nine of them uh, tested low or null for this allergen. So if you want to breed a low, uh, low allergen soybean, you might start with those nine uh, varieties and see what you can do. I clicked on one of them here. Um, just as an example, and then I clicked Add to Order, and I want, and I'll uh, put this on my list. Um, sorghum is another one, like I said, one of my favorite crops. Um, this is a random one here. I was interested in early sorghum that can be grown in the north. A lot of sorghum takes a long time to flower, so I can go. I clicked on this flowering rating here and found the thousands of studies that, of the thousands of accessions that they've studied, this is how the spread breaks down. Um, oh, this is, sorry, this is for seed weight. So the, I, if I want the biggest seeded of these early ones, I'll click, uh, I'll look at this range here, and there are 29 here at the bottom that are, um, that are really heavy seeds. Those are the biggest seeds of the sorghum in the sorghum collection. So why not go right to the one all the way at the bottom, the biggest seeded sorghum of the thousands in the collection. If I want to breed big seeded sorghum, I'll start here. Um, and then I want to see if, it, you know, if it's going to be useful. Photo period sensitive, it might be tough for me to grow in New Jersey. Uh, I actually did grow this one. It grew fine, and then the birds destroyed it. Um, usually they, they leave other ones alone. Uh, I also do a lot of research on perennial grains, as you heard in the intro. Um, and um, 
I found this really interesting thing. I put this one in for Sarah because um, I got this perennial sorghum from her a few years ago, and I didn't know until yesterday that um, it's in the system. We've been calling it M61, but if you see right down at the bottom, M6-1 um, is a perennial uh, hybrid sorghum that was donated uh, just a few years ago by Frank Kutka in 2016, who got it originally from Tim Peters, which is the same source that Andrew and Sarah got it, got it from. Um, it's a really interesting sorghum. We've had one plant survive one winter in New Jersey. Uh, but that's a, that's a start for a, for a breeding, breeding project. Uh, this is perennial Johnson grass that's crossed with the domesticated sorghum. Uh, that this is where it originated, and that's a close-up of the M6-1. Um, this is what it looked like when it was regenerating the second year. On that one plant was just made so many different uh, seed heads. So um, yeah, I put a little, this is what my shopping cart looked like after uh, getting these things. You just hit that checkout button. It'll ask you to, you'll have to create a profile if you don't have one, but it's super easy to do. And then um, these things will start coming in the mail. The, the system will automatically send the requests to the different stations. So you can see here, maintained by. Um, and it'll automatically send a list to each of the curators. And you'll get, the, um, you'll get your germplasm. So again, write down that, that uh, URL at the bottom. It'll take you to another page first. You'll have to click plant germplasm. And then once you get there, I hope that it is easier to navigate after this talk. Uh, feel free to uh, write down my information and get in touch if you have any further questions um, or uh, you want some help navigating any specific things. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll have time for questions at the end for the entire panel. Um, and uh, when you go to that first page, you know, you can also order animal germplasm as well as microbial germplasm. So if you're interested in looking at different rhizobia or symbionts with some of the crops that you're looking at, it's a really wonderful website. So thank you so much, Nate.